Uh, thanks very much, Pat. Uh, you know, speaking of people who change the world, change lives, save lives, um, that's our that's that's my friend Young Zhao. Uh, Dr. Zhao was born, Young Zhao was born in a tiny village in China's Sichuan province, and uh, then he came to uh, the United States to continue his education. Uh, he got his master's and his PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign, and then he came to Michigan State University in 1996. And that's what I met, that's where I met. And uh, it wasn't long before he coaxed me to leave a part of my world and to join part of his world and help to change our world. Um, and he's done that amazingly. He was at MSU a scant five years when he received the highest honor that that institution could give him, University Distinguished Professor. Uh, he brought millions of dollars into the College of Education there. He founded the Center for Teaching and Technology, the Confucius Institute, the U.S.-China Center for Research and Educational Excellence. And then last year, he moved into our time zone to become the Presidential Chair and Associate Dean for Global Education at the University of Oregon. So he's a classic underachiever. Um, <laughs> Dr. Zhao has published more than 20 books and 100 articles. His latest book is from Corwin Press, and it's entitled uh, World Class Learners, Educating Creative and Entrepreneur Entrepreneurial Students. And it's due for, re uh, yeah, easy for me to say. Uh, and it's due for release uh, later this month. Uh, and you have a discounted pre-order form for the book in your conference packet. Uh, last week, Tech and Learning uh, included Dr. Zhao and its list of ten, top 10 most influential people in ed tech. Uh, and here's what they wrote about him. If you ask most educators about heady concepts like the future and globalization, they'll probably ask you, who has time to think about such things? Fortunately for us, Yang Zhao does. Zhao is an advocate for the creative use of modern technology to support student learning. He also encourages teachers to study emerging technologies to better reach students of different cultures in other countries. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. Young Zhao. Well, thank you, Brian. That was uh, great. And uh, you know this, uh, when I went to Michigan State University in 1996, and Brian was working in a school district as a tech director, uh, he was so good, and I had to convince him to leave the district, which I, that's the crime I committed to the students there. But luckily, you know, he uh, and uh, we used to run a huge uh, computer class project, which uh, uh, did happen in about 20 schools in, in Michigan. And uh, for five years, we were encouraging kids to make uh, products with uh, technology. And we still receive uh, emails from those students, changed a lot of lives, so that was really happy to do. And, also, thanks for the, for the college, I think, for cutting the power out. That was a good reminder for us of how technology is important but can go wrong. I really think someone deliberately did it for this conference. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's trying to remind us to say, technology is great, but the human spirit you know, works. I was wondering, actually, Brian was telling me yesterday, we have no power. I was thinking about doing this, uh, use candles on, for PowerPoint and, uh, and the iPad. It's, uh, they should have candle-like, candles-powered iPad stuff. Like. So, I also want to thank the whole conference team. It's coming. I hope it's coming. Is it shifting over? Did you, wow, they did it in the switch thing, the projector. If it's plugged in, it works better. People always tell me that. It uh, worked before. That's what they offer. Yeah. Okay. No signal. That's interesting. Okay, here we go. Yeah, it works. I, I can, do you notice how hard it is nowadays? I uh, you know you can't speak without a PowerPoint. You can't speak without any display. That's uh, we have uh, lost our skills to talk at, at all. <laughs> And uh, Blaine was uh, put up there uh, this um, topic, what I'm going to talk about. Actually, I'm going to start with something else. I'm going to 
but generally talk about what education needs. So I want you to wear your hat, both as educator, but also as a parent, to think about it. So what's the implications about? Uh, I'm going to start by giving you a test. I'm going to ask you some of this. So I saw this uh, advertisement uh, in an uh, airport in Cape Town, South Africa. And so I was really interested in this picture. So I've been showing this photo in the last three months in different countries. I asked people, what do you think this product is? Any guess? What kind of product do you think they are trying to advertise for? GPS. What? GPS. GPS, how smart you are. You're really good, you know. When I was in Australia, I had four groups of educators. They all said, this is advertisement for Viagra. <laughs> I don't know how the authors think come to that conclusion, but it's very really interesting. Can you think why? Can you tell me why? And then of course they have all the, there's the second panel you know, of, of the advertisement, and you have the, the third panel. It's a very smart advertisement, honestly, right? It's they actually have to think about it. People have come in with all kinds of all kinds of answers. But Viagra is the most interesting, and contraception, actually another one I want to talk about, it's uh, and GPS. It's it is actually a GPS system. I, I also show this to other people. Some people think if you're an educational researcher, if you're in a field, you feel like this is about education reform or educational change, right? In the past uh, 20 some years, we've been trying to pick a path in our education reform. Where shall we go? What should we do? I mean, California, you look at right now, you have uh, should we tie test scores to teacher evaluation in the K 12 system? Should we go online? You have all these different choices. And hopefully we're not going to end up like in this place. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I think uh, today, actually, with all this great technology we are afforded with, with all these powerful tools, we actually have to really think about really where we're going. No matter you know, where you go, no matter how good a technology you have as a GPS. By the way, I downloaded the 99 cent one yesterday. The GPS actually worked fine on my iPhone. And so it took me here, it's great. And uh, if you don't know your ultimate destination, it won't help you. You know, this morning I still have to know, I gotta go to every, you know, every Granada college before I do that, no matter how good the GPS is. But I feel like right now education may have lost the purpose in all these problems that Renee was talking about. I think a lot of times, time changes so fast, we have forgotten why we want to educate and to what purpose, to what goal we think about that. Uh, even students come to your schools, by the way, one of your most uh, well known, actually, I think, uh, alumni uh, out of community college is George Lucas. It's, uh, you know, he was, it's out of community college system, the best exam. You should get him to speak next time because he was really good. <laughs> he, he really thinks a lot about educational issues. Because we often ask the question, where shall we go? If you have children like me right, right now, think about what kind of education are we providing to our students? We will create so many opportunities, uh, but how come we don't tap into them? My son is uh, in college right now, he's gonna graduate next year. So it's getting me thinking about, has he had a great education for the past 16 years? It costs a lot of money, not only taxpayers' money, my own money too, you know, he's in college, it's a lot of money. And I'm gonna think about what would be a good measure of the quality of his education. Right now, I, mean, I used to have a lot more dreams for him. Now he's uh, approaching graduation, I'm kind of changing my indicator. If he doesn't move back to my basement, that's success. I think that's, that's how I think about education nowadays. And my, my daughter is, um, my daughter, by the way, that, that's my daughter. <laughs> She's, uh, she's in high school. We're thinking about the same issue. What kind of education what we need to deliver? There are some stories, think about the past month, has been very fascinating in terms of education. Why is that you have uh, the Facebook IPO? Remember that? Did anyone of you got a stock? You have some shares, no? Uh, well, good for you, you know. It's, uh, uh, I didn't uh, do it either, okay? I, uh, but I think about Facebook, but it's a very interesting story. Regardless of where it might go, I mean, it's going to be dead someday. It's not going to last forever. If uh, Kodak can die, Facebook is going to die, right? It's the uh, end of this. 
But what's interesting is that it's um, here you got a 28 year old and who practically dropped out of public school and went to private school, then went to Harvard, dropped out of Harvard, but all the time he created a kingdom of over 900 million people. That's a lot of people. That's the third largest country in the world, right? After China, India. And then he created a company at this on the first day. It was so was valued at a hundred billion dollars, right? That's a lot of money too. I think it's a lot of money. And uh, at the same time, he himself has made about twenty billion dollars worth that much. I don't know how much it's worth today, but at least it was worth that much at that time. And they said, about the same time, you must have read stories like this. In the U.S., for the first time in the U.S. history, credit debt has surpassed credit card debt, reached over $1 trillion. That's a lot of money in the U.S., right? $1 trillion. And also for the first time, there are more people with college degrees who are unemployed than those without college degrees. 4.3 million students and people in the U.S. with college degrees do not have a job, and only like this is about 9 million people. So this is it's really fascinating to start to look at this whole story. What's happening here? So my puzzle is this: What's wrong with our college education, or what's wrong with our education in general? But by the way, those people are unemployed. None of them got a degree from California Community Colleges. So you guys, <laughs> you're, you're okay. You're safe. It's, it's all the other people. And so. What is wrong in our education? What's happening in our education? When we send our children, when they graduate, on average, American students, college students, owe someone $23,000 as college debt. So when we talk about going to college, we have to ask the question about going to what college? How everything is affecting all of us? So that's really what I have been trying to think about, and I'm going to try to talk about as well, today, the, the slides I use will be on this website. And uh, you can, there's a lot more stuff I, I write up there to think about uh, what education can be. By the way, this is the only website, forget about OCT portal, this you need for education. <laughs> you don't need anything else. That, this is it. It's, uh, and uh, uh, Blaine was talking about that this was my last book, and the next book is coming out. Uh, Probably in about two weeks, I think I just finished the final proof. And it's really come to the idea about what makes a future path valuable. As you heard from actor Renee, it was really good. You know, on the one hand, we have 9 million people unemployed in this country. On the other hand, we're talking about running out of talents. This is really kind of fascinating, right? You got people who are looking for jobs, you got people looking for talents. Why this gap? This gap, we have to blame our education system. Now, because our education system has a lot to do with what we teach, what we define. So what I would like to argue, to begin with, our education traditionally has been aimed to produce employees, to produce people who want to look for jobs, not those who want to create jobs. The difference between Mark Zuckerberg and the other four some million people is Zuckerberg had an idea. He went to create something, not only a job for himself, but a job for um, jobs for thousands of other people, and then tens of thousands of other people. How come the other nine million people unemployed don't try to act to think about? I think the missing link, in essence, is that this entrepreneur spirit, that we have been trying to prepare people as employees, not as entrepreneurs. And now, why do we need entrepreneurs? can think about this is that I think, thank you actually uh, Pat and Rene for arranging that. She has laid the, 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 the foreground already and I can repeat a lot of it. But just some we almost rely on the same set of data. Uh, the first I want to redefine entrepreneurs. Traditionally we think about entrepreneurs as uh, people who try to maximize a profit. Say about business, try to make money. Today actually the term of entrepreneurs have changed, have been redefined. We have people who want to maximize social impact, we call them social entrepreneurs. We have people who are, many people like you, who are trying to bring change within an organization of industry, we call them intrapreneurs, like entrepreneurs within an organization. We have, uh, you know, uh, policy entrepreneurs, that's a new term, that's a wishful term for bureaucrats, you know, so, so 
We hope that we have parties of entrepreneurs, not bureaucrats. And, uh, you know, because they have they face big public policy challenges. Uh, healthcare, education, they need to change as well. And of course, public institutions like community colleges face tremendous challenges. We need all presidents, all leaders to become college entrepreneurs. I, I think uh, I love the community schools and the community college system in the US, but one thing it is that it's been always locally defined. You serve a local uh, uh, entity and you are local. That's one of the biggest problems. Now with 112 community colleges, you got over 8 million students, but anyone's telling me, that's really two Singapores and two Finlands. You have two big countries going with you. You cannot be isolated. You have to be going global. I was looking at many of the things you do. Why can't we take your stuff global? You know, offer the community college experience from California to people in China, in Japan. You know. By the way, actually, China is trying to learn from the US. The biggest mistake of the past 20 years, actually, Asian countries. When they come to learn uh, uh, about education in the US, the biggest mistake they make is they all go to Stanford. <laughs> they go to Harvard and they don't come to community colleges. I tell them in the US, the US economy is really actually built by community colleges. Stanford, those guys are nice places to visit, but they're confusing campus. I got lost yesterday, so that's why I have bad things to say about them. It's, uh, they can't even get them, you know. Unlike every brain, I come in, I go to the building right away. It's like three seconds. It took me three hours to go around to find a building in uh, Stanford, that's why. They did community college people. But anyway, so, <laughs> however, I, the, the idea is that we need different kind of people. Today's entrepreneurs are redefined as people call them blue collar, uh, black collar workers, which is inspired by uh, Steve Jobs and the black turtle, uh, turtle mix, as we call it. We need entrepreneurs that call black collar workers, people who are creative, innovative, globally minded. So the talent will be global, creative and entrepreneur. So entrepreneurs are simply people when they are not happy with that situation, they don't complain. They try to change it. They try to use their talents and strength. They try to solve the problem. That's all. We will define entrepreneurs. We should all define that. So in our classrooms, I'll be helping our children to think that there are new jobs for you. Make one. So that's the idea of entrepreneurs. But why do we need these people? Suddenly, before for a long time, movements really didn't have much need for this. We need, you know, once every hundred years, we got a Henry Ford, we're happy. You know, by accident, we can, we can use one. You know, every few hundred, another few, a few decades, we get uh, another guy. That's we're happy. But now, we need something we call mass entrepreneurship. That everyone needs to be entrepreneurial. The reason, number one, we just simply get too many people looking for jobs. Too many people. This is the, the population growth, very simple. You look at uh, how we have grown. We add now about a billion people every half, every 15 years. That's a lot of people to add, a billion people. And also, most of the people were added in developing countries. In developing countries where they do not have good access to great education, they can only develop fairly low level skills. Which means that number one, they will need a lot of jobs. If they're not, if they are unemployed, the world is not going to be peaceful. You saw that in Arab Spring, all the revolution, all those things. The second thing, because they have low skills and they cost much less, therefore they will be the major destination of job outsource. They'll take a lot of jobs come. So that's for two reasons. And then you think about it, who Workforce surplus. We got so many people. Right now, we have hundreds of millions of people globally will be waiting for a job. So, if we all try to do the same to wait for the job, they will not be there. And then, if we go out, we think about oh, uh, this is the one I think. Uh, I believe you know. I'm so happy to be aligned with Cisco folks. And uh, the, this is the, the data. If you look at this data, the, the, the fast growth. I think we have this. Data. When I look at this piece, actually, I think of something slightly different. We have become much more wealthier than before. Therefore, we actually consume different goods. We need people to make new things. That's the question, that's the issue. If you think about over the past 100 years in the US, in about 1900, Americans, the average American household income was about $8,000. Can you believe it? it? You know, your ancestors survived about $8,000 $8, a year. That's, that's not a lot of money, right? It's, uh, 
And now, half of that money went to necessities. Clothing, food, and shelter. That went there. And that not only how much, 7, 8%. So you don't have much money for anything else. Today, the US average household income is over $56,000. Kind of, I know you still don't feel like you have enough money, but that's the, that's the fact. You got a lot more money now. We spent half of that $56,000 on necessities. Where did the other half go? How do you, how do you waste the other, you know, kind of half of the $56,000? You buy useless stuff. <laughs> like the iPhone, you know, that's what we do. It's a, you buy useless stuff. It's a, we began to consume different products. You buy, you watch um, uh, silly TV channels like cooking shows. You know, that was, you know how many cooking shows we have? I mean, 20 years ago, was there cooking shows, Irish chef, you know, I don't know, all the kind of chefs. You know. How many YouTube channels we have? Look at the music, iTunes, right? It's, it's amazing. We consume different things. And for ladies, what do you do? You spend $500 buying a bag. That's just hold as much as a plastic bag, you know. So. But you do this. Thing. You spend more money on this stuff. You go to hairstylists. It's not a barber anymore, right? What this basically means, the wealth, increase, technological changes, globalization has forced us to create different products to meet different needs. To meet those needs that have not been met before or have not even been discovered. You know, when you think about iPhone as useless, do we really need an iPhone? I know my daughter keeps convinced that she needs an iPhone. She really needs an iPhone 4S too, you know, she really needs it. I tried to convince her, I said, now it's actually you want it. Then we had a long philosophical discussion between needs and wants, okay? So today, in essence, wants have become needs. We are creating products to satisfy not physical needs, not physiological needs, but psychological, spiritual, and cultural needs. That's why it's, so it's about differentiation, about personalized consumption. That's why we buy this. I think any of you can justify why you want to like, oh, look at the wine industry, right? So when I went to college in China, all we want to try to buy is efficiency. As much, as little money as possible get you as drunk as fast. As fast as possible. That's what we used to do, right? When you have no money, you're trying to basically go for the high alcohol level. That's, that's it. Now you have it, you don't want to do that anymore. It's a change in human taste. But where do we get people to discover, to create new customers? Like entrepreneurs don't create products, they create customers. Think about Facebook. What do you do? It's basically create something with waste more of our time. That's it, right? That, that's, that's the basic something. If you think about it, it's nothing. You know, you're worth so much money, it's nothing. It's right. I was just fascinated by this idea. So we have to think about it from this perspective. We do not spend nearly as much time or effort in creating the so-called necessities anymore. We don't spend time with so that's one big thing, and that's why, if you look at in the U.S., big challenge, very simple. We have been complaining about the loss of jobs in the manufacturing industry uh, sector. We are also have been complaining about the shrinking of middle class over the past few decades. The shrinking basically came from the manufacturing group. Uh, Blaine and I, you know, we used to live in Michigan. Michigan is a prime example. Before, I was in the 1960s, even the 70s, when you graduate from high school, you don't really have to be great. You, we don't want you to be very creative when you go work for Henry Ford. You do not want a car to be assembled by Lady Gaga, for example. <laughs> you, want, you want someone to follow orders, this, this. So you go there, you join the union, you work on the assembly line, you become one of millions of workers. And that job, with the union, you can guarantee you a pretty good income. That's the, you know, the big middle class growing up. But now those jobs, as I said before, are outsourced. They're gone. So that's why over the past few decades, the top 10% income has increased. Who are the top 10%? The top 10% are the creative. This is a simple diagram showing how the US jobs in the manufacturing sector has been lost over the past few decades, the red line. But the manufacturing sector has been growing in, in its value because of outsourcing, because of technology. A factory in Gary, Indiana used to have 5,000 people, now maybe 500 people. And the rest either have been outsourced or replaced with machines. So what's going to happen? Why do we need the entrepreneurs? Well, another reason is that 
Oh, this is something cool. This is right at home. This is uh, the value distribution of Apple's iPhone. The $299 in 2010. So where, when you pay that money, where did the money go? Well, 58% went right here, went Apple computers. The red part, 2% went to China. And you look at the other set of data, it's more interesting. Apple employed 43,000 people in the US, 20,000 overseas, and they kept 58% of all the money and China has over 700,000 people working on this iPhone. What do they do? They put the glass together. They put the glass on. Just hands behind you because it cannot be machined. They only kept 2%. This and then the other uh, parts basically shows the whole global supply chain model. Where do value go? It goes to the high end. Not that China doesn't want it. China wants it, but China cannot. Because what I will explain, the difference in education, in education philosophy, in educational systems. So this shows that we have to occupy the blue part. For the reason that our labor costs more, we have better education, we spend more money on education, and also for the reason that we have to go there because all the others have been occupied by the other 7 billion people who can't have access to this. So the creative, the entrepreneur is a requirement. And you look some general in the population growth as well. From data, this is from Richard Flores, uh, Florida's data. The growing trend in the US, the creative core, creative professionals. This basically shows that, by the way, is that it's not whether we want to be there, it's we have to be there. It's all in terms of sector change in all the kind of jobs. Now, the question is that. What makes an entrepreneur? That's the more interesting part. So do you want to debate are entrepreneurs born or are they made? This is a question everyone's trying to, uh, trying to answer. If, if you're born, you know, can we now genetically program with some uh, entrepreneurs out there? Or do you have to, can you do something else? What can you do with the, the, this one? So then this is the part that fascinates me. You can do any research on entrepreneurs. But think about, these are the general qualities. Number one, they're very confident. So confident people. Uh, recently, I think the New York Times writes says uh, Zuckerberg was insanely confident. I mean, if you drive around this whole area, you're running a lot of those confident people, right? Anyway, any entrepreneurs. Because if you want to start something new, most people don't like it. You know, if any innovator, like you guys, you know this. You are, you are the innovators as innovative instructors. You know what you're doing now are not necessarily endorsed embraced, supported by everybody. You have to be confident, you know, it's a, you almost have a level of arrogance to say, I got this right. And also friends, all entrepreneurs, all creative people, have to have a lot of big network of social, social uh, network of friends. Like you were talking about, it's a, if you don't have friends, you can't really do it. That, that's a big issue. And uh, all innovators too. And also friends. Makes a big difference in terms of what kind of friends you have. Is if you are make friends with only people who like like you, that won't work. It's uh, you want friends who are different, who are different sectors. We call you have different social networks. The, the problem with the internet today, with the Google, with all this data tracking, learning analytics, we can only find things that we like. Do you notice this on your friends? You know, you you look like everybody agrees with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm Google. Google tracks that. You know that Google tracks that. It says, if you look at this news, you will like this news. You, are, you won't say anything that you don't like. Now that's from the, that's a problem with us. We have that. to be entrepreneurial, to be creative. We got to go find people who are different from us. They are, of course, risk taking, and we have to say more about that. And of course, you have the passion and creativity and perseverance, all of those things. But now the issue is that how do we cultivate? How can education be deliberately designed to do that? Let me start by saying that how education does it and give some systems uh, and some ideas. Because right now, the first one is think about this, China. Why can China have a Steve Jobs? You must have heard a lot about China's rising uh, in, as the economy. You heard a lot about Chinese education being great. You heard of that. You've all read uh, the Tiger Mom book, right? Tiger Mom from uh, talk about all the Chinese parents are doing great. You've heard of all those things, right? And the US now is thinking China is a great country. And in terms of education, economy, it's China fear. 
And recently, Congress, actually, our US Congress had a big panel discussion to ask, can China have a Steve Jobs? What they produce? It's like a symbolic creative entrepreneur. It's, and China has been said, it's, it's fearful by many people who think that, because China has traditionally scored very high in terms of their testing. This is the most recent, recent PISA scores. You may not know what PISA is. PISA is the uh, International Academic Horse Race, I call it. It's basically, it's a test uh, of uh, in math, reading, and science of 15 year olds in over 60 countries. Last round was in 2009, data was released in 2010. This round is happening right now, okay? Some six countries, China, Shanghai, for the first time they participated in this study and uh, took number one spot. If you are looking for the US, you can find it because the, 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 the screen is not big enough. It's too low, it's, uh, it's, it's go down the basement, you can find it there. It's, uh, America is not here at all. <laughs> so when this data was released, everybody thought China was amazing. So people began in the US. Obama, President Obama called this a Sputnik moment. Some of you may be old enough to remember Sputnik, like the Soviet Union. So, so China is going to take over, going to crush us with the math scores. That's the, uh, the analogy. And Arnie Duncan, the US Secretary of Education, called that China, this is an absolute wake up call to fix American's broken education. And now there's an agenda called, in, in the call that we have to surpass Shanghai as a national education agenda. This is a book out of Harvard Education Press. That's why I say that they go to the wrong place. They should come to community colleges. You know, those, those guys probably send the books like this. It's, anyways, it's a book. It's called the American National Education Agenda is to Surpass Shanghai. This just came out. It was really interesting. When I look at this book, it's America's uh, national aspiration is getting worse and worse. As an immigrant, I came here. I, I, I loved America's great aspirations. Remember in the 1960s, John F. Kennedy's dream was to send someone to the moon. That was pretty aspirational. That's cool, right? That's like, I like that. It's a, then you come down to George Bush. Remember George Bush, uh, the baby Bush? You know, he was a, it, it's a, it, it, and he made a lot of terms, and he was talking about more and more imports are coming from foreign countries, for example. There was a great, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a great, I mean, it's a great thing. But anyway, he, he was, his national goal, his national goal was, uh, he said that it's uh, read. It's uh, make every third grade uh, be able to read. That, that's uh, his national goal. You know, reading can be tough for him, but shouldn't be a national goal. It's, uh, it's, that, that's, uh, now we want to surpass Shanghai. It's, it's, this is really interesting. But honestly, China supposed to have the best education system. And Americans are not the only ones who aspire that, to, to want to become China. Recently in Australia, uh, a new study came out to say Australian students are two years behind in mathematics than students in China. Remember, there's a 15-year-old. If you're two years behind, that's a lot of years behind. You're only in school for seven years. That's not a lot. And in the US, I gotta get it. The US glorification of fear of China is growing almost into unreasonable rate. You guys in California, if you don't uh, know this, uh, I don't even know. There was a governor in Pennsylvania called Ed Randall. Do you remember? Yeah. It was two-term, right? Two-term governor. And about three years ago, I think before he stepped down, there was an NFL game, you know, how crazy we are about the, the football game, uh, scheduled in Philadelphia, but had to be postponed because of a uh, snowstorm. And the governor was very really happy about that. So he got on radio and uh, lamented on the fact that this is crazy. This is what they said. They said that we've become a nation of pussies. <laughs> the Chinese are kicking our butt in everything. So if this was in China, do you think the Chinese would have caught up the game? People would have been marching down to the state and they would have been, what? And they would have been doing the pirates. <laughs> this admiration of Chinese education, and it's, it's very explicit, you know what I'm But I mean, I'm not saying I never got it, why he would drag China into football game. China has got to play football, but it's, uh, that's how they think about it. Then in England, England they do the same thing. Yeah, England they talk about uh, uh, Michael Gove, he's a new secretary of education, talk about, I'm happy to confess I'd like us to implement a college revolution, just like the one they've had in China. I have no idea why he said this. He probably doesn't know what a cultural revolution was. <laughs> and he said, uh, 
the like Chairman Mao, you know, it's a, we have a, a long march to reform our education system. It's very interesting. <laughs> Australia, the US, and England. They all admire China, but China itself hates its education system <laughs> because it cannot have Steve Jobs. Uh, uh, when Jia Mao is the Chinese premier, he recently, last December, uh, was visited to a lot of factories and spoken to a group of business leaders said, we must have a Steve Jobs. Then the Chinese said, we can't have a Steve Jobs. Actually, uh, the Kai Fu Li was the Google president of China, uh, China the, the Google China, then now he's resigned, but he, said, he himself, has a lot of credibility. The reason is that he immigrated from Taiwan to Tennessee and did not exactly go through the community college system. He went to Columbia and then went to Carnegie Mellon. But he's a really great guy, worked at Apple and was vice president of Microsoft. He said openly that China will not be able to produce Steve Jobs unless, unless they can abolish, abandon, destroy its own education system. So here we have one said the best education system. Here's some said, no, it's, it's a horrible system. How do we reconcile? And China absolutely is dying for Steve Jobs and for anyone actually. If you look at the data, China has in 2008, China had only 473 happy findings. The US has over 14,000. Think of this. With 20% of the GDP, now think of the population, 9% of GDP, 12% of spending in R&D, they have less than 1% of patents. That's a measure of innovation. And out of the 473, what's worse? Half of that actually came from foreign companies. As a nation, can you believe, if you have the best education system, how can you do so poorly as one indicator? And if you think the other way, whether entrepreneurs are born or not, if they were born, there got to be more babies Steve Jobs born in China, simply because they're four times of the population. <laughs> right? So that's a simple thing, because you can't, it can't be worse. So I don't believe American trees you know, bear more fruits like Steve Jobs. I think they, you know, has to be the culture education system. So what happened there? That, that's the interesting part. Why can't they have Steve Jobs? They actually simply the happened in Singapore. Singapore has been a country that always scored very high. Uh, Steve Wozniak, the, the great Woz, said to Singaporeans that you can't have uh, Steve Jobs Apple computers either because of your education system. Now you have two great education systems supposedly measure and test scores. Why can't they produce entrepreneurs like so that, that's very interesting. Actually, uh, then not only the Asian education system, but think about this part too. The, about the modern minority. By the way, you know, I'll, I'll have to show this set of slides. I'm skipping a lot of slides. Um, I'm not, not going to use all the slides. I create more slides than I'm going to use. Glenn said I'm paid by the number of slides I make. So <laughs> I make a lot of slides. I got to use them. But this actually is an interesting question to think about. You, you, in California, you have a lot of risk, racial issues in education. And uh, there's one term that was very racist, racist term that's coined in the 1950s called the modern minority. That's, right, that's, that's by people who are trying to deny the existence of racism in this country. So modern minority has been typically referred to the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, East Asian immigrants. So, those guys could make it in a society, how come other groups cannot? So that's what I'm denying this. However, this term has been continued to be used today in education. You know, that who is a model minority? We by, by, you know, stereotypically, I'm a model minority. That's why I had to put a tie on. I normally don't because you look at this thing. The, but the Asian kids somehow always score better academically than kids in other groups, in other, you know, in other places. This is naturally true. Let's look at the uh, Asian kids up score all other groups, including Caucasians, in test scores. And it's getting even worse if you look at the, the great academic achievement of Asians. As 5% of the US population, 5%, they take 15 to 25% of Ivy League enrollment. That's way out of their proportion. And at Stanford, there are 24% of Asians and 46% of USA Berkeley. 
And we have USA Los Angeles, USA LA stands for USA Lots of Asians. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it goes, right? So, now if you can think about this, it, that's shocking me great academic achievement. That's why the Tiger Mom was bragging about Asian minorities. But in real life, they don't go very far. Look at this, uh, the, the most recent data release. About 2% of the Fortune 500 companies' board seats are agents. So the agents are reflecting what's going on there. We achieve so well academically, why don't we achieve well in life, in career? And then the question, of course, we, we can think about, maybe there's a glass ceiling for agents. You know, recently, of course, agents would call it uh, the bamboo ceiling. We don't call it the, the, the glass ceiling. We think about that. Or maybe because our education actually damaged in some ways. So that, that's, that's you know, one thing about. And another set of questions people will always ask is that uh, when we ask those questions, is to say, what's going on with all this data? You know, to say, what's happening? So here's what we think about. How do we explain this? I will go back to say we explain this difference. Do you remember talk about um, confidence? in entrepreneurs. This is another set of data uh, come from TIMSS. TIMSS is a Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study. It's 2003 data. As usual, US students are way below Asian countries. Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Korea, and Japan, as usual. On the same test, this is math scores. On the same math test, they ask two other questions that has to do with the emotional side. One is about confidence. Do you think you can do mathematics well? That's the question. The, the number two is do you enjoy math? And as no surprise, American students are very ignorant mathematically, but they're extremely confident. <laughs> so, so here's the deal is they, they outscore everybody else. They're very happy. You know, I may not do it right. I may not get the score, but I think I can do it. It's a, and look, uh, some more data. Uh, uh, this is Singapore versus the U.S. Singapore was number one their students met. But uh, out of the number one country, only 18% of their students agree that they can do well in mathematics. In the U.S., we rank very, very low, almost the bottom. But our kids, nearly 40% said, I'm very confident. I, can, I think I do well in math. It's, uh, well, internationally, it's even true. It's all negative correlation. Countries score very well, have low confidence. Countries scoring on low have high confidence. So that got a lot of educational researchers puzzled. In America, you look right now today, in California, if you know your students, you know any teacher, you know this, it's true. And this is the result. American people, policymakers, they think the high confidence and high enjoyment cause the low math score. Simply stated, American kids are not good at mathematics because they're too happy. <laughs> not to improve our math performance. We need to make them less happy. <laughs> Why are they happy? They're confident? Because they don't know how bad they are. <laughs> how come they don't know how bad they are? Because we don't have high standards. We don't have global benchmark standards. So for the past three decades, in the US has been for higher standards. Do you notice this thing, right? I talk about standards. We want to make sure we bring high standards. We bring Singapore math. We are doing bring PISA math. Now, you know, after states find their standards, we have a national standard coming on for the Common Core standards. Have you heard of the Common Core? Yeah, you heard of Common Core. It's probably the best, you know, so would the snake oil you can have, but it's, it's, it's there. It's, and it, it coming down. And also, not only do we have to have higher standards to make our children feel inadequate all the time, you have to make tests, test them often. Not only test them, but rank them very often. To make sure that many know they are not only worse than their neighbor, but they are worse you know, with the common assessment than people in Oregon, Idaho, they're worse than people in other countries. So finally teach them some, them some humility that they can improve the math scores. That's the idea in the US. The Asian countries actually look very different because they know lack of confidence is the root cause of lack of entrepreneurship and creativity. See, all the East Asian countries, they've been taking the opposite. They've been trying to reduce the content demand, trying to lower the standard, lower the importance of testing, and make sure children can 
go out there to study something else. Because when you spend all your time studying, you don't have time for something else. Yesterday, actually, I went to Stanford for a real reason. The, the, the filmmaker of uh, Race to Nowhere was doing an interview with me about this. And we had a lot of discussion about why Asian countries lack confidence. Because if you are confronted with tough problems all the time, you feel inadequate. And when you are ranked all the time, because you are ranked only on one score, remember this one? The only, you are only good. You are good only when you are better than others. You know, when Tiger Mom talked about pick number one, there's only one number one. You, you will always be worse. 99% of you worse than the number one person. Uh, well, I would argue a much broader education would be in, like in the U.S. It's like the Lake Wobbledon, you know, a garrison tier type of education. It was about where all children can be above average, right? That, that's how we get there. So it's very interesting. This is number one explanation. Is it? U.S. education for a long time has enabled our children to be more confident. When you have the confidence, you could win. The second explanation has to do with, uh, with uh, Lady Gaga. Can you come over here? <laughs> so, you know, think about what, what has Lady Gaga to do with? I can't find a picture that's appropriate for you. <laughs> She's a, uh, the, Lady Gaga is a very interesting phenomenon. And with China, if you say China cannot have Steve Jobs, they cannot have Lady Gaga. <laughs> but that's the same thing. Basically, these are exceptional talents. Exceptional in their own ways. I think that if you think about Lady Gaga, what can she do? She's worth a lot of money, she has a lot of followers, she's an entrepreneur, she's created jobs for other people. You may not like her music or how she dresses up, you may not like any of those things. But in fact, the, the fact that she has made some people me. Now, the issue is this. If you think about our schools, which school can you claim you have the curriculum to create a Lady Gaga? <laughs> Do you have a community college that I'm going to prepare a Lady Gaga for you? You can't. That has to do with our education. When we're education, is always about creating a curriculum. Right? We, we create a curriculum like this. Education, for a long time, we will try to prepare employees. We design a curriculum, and we say we make a guess what the society might need as desirable skills or talents. We take people, no matter who you are, what you are, we run you through this 15 years, 12 years, 16 years system. It's like making sausage, right? We try to run you through this, hopefully you will become useful. That's the traditional model. We define something. That's why in our schools we have uh, math and reading, because we, we bet in the future we'll need that, right? We need the social studies, we need this. That's how we do this typical system. Now, Lady Gaga is someone in the system who may not fit anyone here, right? So she could be. That doesn't matter. But in this whole process, it's about producing anything different from those talents are considered what considered outliers. How do we treat outliers becomes very cool, becomes very important. If you think about this, I'm going to take you back to my little village a little bit. That's my my father's life skills. You know, he lives still, he lives in the village, he's 85, he's been he's illiterate. So I had a long discussion with my father last year about Lady Gaga. You know. If he doesn't watch TV, I have no idea who Lady Gaga is. You know. But we were talking about great education and curriculum. In my village, if my father were to design a curriculum, a core curriculum for all the village children in the future, he could make a prediction. Because the village life doesn't change much. And his prediction is that, okay, the most important subject in our village would be how to drive a water buffalo and how to carry things on a bamboo pole or carry things. You know, that, that's two things. So that's the core curriculum, that's the math and science. And I wasn't good at either one, I had to leave the village, but that, that's, that's, that's it. <laughs> then I was asking my father, if you think about Lady Gaga come to this village, go to the village school, how would she do? Naturally, she wouldn't be great. She wouldn't do well, right? And you know, and plus she wears meat. That's a problem for the village. You have none of that. It's a, now, when you cannot, if you don't fit the curriculum, has to do. Does the system tolerate those people? In Asian countries, in order to get high scores, we don't put up with those people. We sort them through 
So everybody is going up this one path. Therefore, you have great test scores. But any of those outliers were kicked out of the system. So I would call them, those are the sources leak out, and then they become good bacon. But that, that's the idea. It's, it's, uh, so, so America, in essence, as an education system, is a broken sausage making machine. <laughs> so we have people who have left out. Think like, what's doing George Lucas? It's an idea. We are left out. We did not fit the traditional curriculum. So that's something we have to think about. Number one is that, are you cultivating confidence? Number two, are we trying to plug the holes to make sure everybody follows the same system? So that's, that's a big challenge for us to think about education. Now, if you look at globally speaking too, we, all schools, in some way, we stifle entrepreneurship. Schools, all schools do that, because we have to teach people to conform. There are certain basics, there are certain social norms we have to obey. We have to do that. Uh, you know, some of the data will show that uh, this was data about how our creativity declines as we get older. This was uh, George Lanz in the 1960s, longitudinal data using diversity thinking measures that NASA uses uh, to track. When you measure the five-year-old, about 98% of them were at genius creative level. When they go to about 15-year-old, uh, about 10%, less than 10%. You know, when they measure all adults, 2% at the same level. It's very interesting. And of course, look at different countries. The PISA scores, the red, is the ranking based on mathematics scores. And the blue is based on entrepreneur capabilities. They don't go together. So that's why how countries score high on math don't do well in entrepreneur capabilities. Because entrepreneurs is about taking risks. It's about asking questions. It's not about trying to find answers. Tests rewards your ability to, you know, to come back with answers. So what I would suggest, as in my new book, I would think about, by the way, there's some more data to say how they're all negatively correlated, you know, entrepreneurs and test scores. So in my new book, I'm thinking about how do we get an education? American education so far has produced entrepreneurs not by design, but by accident. As I showed you that, we just let them leak out. Now, so we did not kill them. That, that, that's basic name. It's, uh, and now, how do we design a system that's from accent to design? This has a lot to do with the community colleges. Because many people think about, we need to have entrepreneurship education program. That's actually very dangerous. Because as spirit, when you standardize entrepreneurs, you can't produce them. So what, what do we do? Here's something, I think, a challenging thing for all of you when you think globally. Number one, you know, we need to really, as a philosophy, I think our education should be thinking about not narrowing their capability, but expanding it. With that belief, remember the first few slides I showed you today is that how there are different type of professions, careers, changes. Number one is accept that every talent, every passion we develop fully can be useful. If Lady Gaga is useful, anyone can be useful. <laughs> <laughs> the issue is that how can we get there? Traditional jobs as a manufacturer in an auto company, we need a lot of people with similar skills, but just good enough. They don't have to be great. We don't want you to be great. Remember, we just hire you there, we can train you. Today is about personalized consumption, about personality, about creativity that has to be unique and great. That means everyone, if you, if you are great in anything, out of the 7 billion people on earth, someone can find you. If you try this, actually get on Facebook, try this. If you become so quirky that no one likes it, people will like you. It's just, it's, it's, about, it's really strange. It's, uh, you have to be great. But how can you become great? Greatness is not born. Greatness is learned. Greatness comes from three simple things. Number one, spend a lot of time on it. You know this thing, right? A 10,000 hour rule. If you spend time on something, you will become great. So whether it's with, with, like with technology, if you spend a sufficient time, you will become good at it. Now the second problem comes up with the second element. How do you, why do you want to spend 10,000 hours on something you're not interested? That's the question. So the second element of being great is called passion, interest, and motivation. 
So people have to find what they're interested in so they can spend uh, 10,000 hours. The third one comes, has a lot to do with you. It's, good, called, it's called good coaching, teaching. Because 10,000 hours of experience should be very different from 10,000 hours, or it should be experience different from one hour of experience repeated 10,000 times. <laughs> right? If you repeat, that would work. That, that's where teachers come in, help them vary those things. So here's my suggestion for the, in essence, a great education from kindergarten up to college, for all your life, should have the three elements. Number one is a personalized learning path and curriculum. It's different from differentiated instruction or individualized. It's children construct, co-construct their curriculum with you. If you have kids or grandkids are in the radio and video kindergarten, you know what that means. It's called emerging curriculum. The curriculum and learning follows child. I think technology, online learning, the best thing it does is that it affords all our children to be able to learn anything that's not, that's not necessarily locally available. So that's one thing about technology. Online open is that you should not limit what your children learn by saying, oh, we don't have that, we can't offer it. There's no excuse. If child wants to pursue something, they should be able to give them the opportunity to do that. So that's today we need to get children's voice and choice in a curriculum. Community colleges have typically been doing great in that area, but not to a personalized level yet. Strength-based education. Number two is called product-oriented learning. You have that's you guys are great, but project-based learning is not necessarily the same. We do a lot of project-based learning. My children have been growing pumpkin seeds you know, for, since for, for, for elementary school many years. And you've been, but, but a lot of times, you remember your time? So 12 years in school, you create a lot of products which really nobody like, cares other than the teacher. You don't even care. You get an A, you get a B, they're done with it. And then before you are like, a, before uh, fourth grade, you have a refrigerator to, to exhibit your product, right? If you had a clever parent, but after that, nobody cares. We want children to be able to create products. Entrepreneurs, creators come out of making things. Making things that's meaningful for themselves or for other people. That's our model. When, when Brent Lane and I, we worked from uh, the computer clubhouse. Our slogan is children have to create things that matter. Either personally meaningful or useful to others. I think if you start from there, they will learn the basics. Knowledge and the basics will be sought after, not imposed upon. And finally, it has to happen on the growth. The growth of happens. So where I think online learning happens is really going to happen in a very different domain that you bring resources from outside. You expand your students' products to other people. You know, we have projects right now, have American children, simply first graders, second graders, making English textbooks for kids in China. And vice versa. That, that's much more interesting than writing something for the teacher. So to end, I have uh, at the University of Oregon, we are building a big system and for online global, mostly K-12, I'm trying to convince all of you to tap onto the system. It's called OPA. The, what it is, it's, a, it's in essence a global online teaching and global entrepreneurship creating system. We are allowing access to every K-12 school, anyone in different countries, to be on the system to create online courses for their own students and for students in other countries. And we charge only one dollar per student per year. And we also allow other organizations, community colleges, if you have courses on offer, you can reach to Chinese students, Japanese students, you can charge whatever money you like. More importantly, we are allowing the system, allow every school to have their children to create products for others. If you're interested, you can get on this one. And that's what we have been doing. So to end, uh, Pat is coming to kick me out now, but now I'm gonna, no, no, don't. <laughs> but anyways, I want to summarize then about entrepreneurship, creativity, global-mindedness is going to be the hallmarks of our future talents. If we try to compete to prepare the basic skills, the routine skills, they can either be done more efficiently by machines or replaced by cheaper workforce in other places. So I think community colleges are right there, doing the right thing, and if we can get a global, will be great.
Thank you. that I'm reflecting on, and I just want to say thank you for being here. Um, my name is Michelle Kosminski brock and I teach a class through Outline for um, really anyone who wants to take it, but it's called Building Online Community with Social Media. And the class invites um, teachers, professors to come in and learn about how to use social media, uh, which is really a fabulous way to uh, engage our students in creating content. And so I guess one of the things I'm thinking about is this real opportunity that we have amidst us right now with this amazing technological revolution that we're a part of with mobility, with Web 2.0, with social media. And it's something that we, first of all, I believe we need to participate in ourselves and become content creators as educators because it's only when we start to create our own content that we start to understand how empowering it is. And so I just want to really instill that message and encourage everyone to try to make that leap. And I know that it can often feel scary and um, push you into a place where you've never been before. But there's